Welcome to our Friday Bible study. I'm Pastor Michael Walther from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church here in Collinsville. This is a Bible study that I promised I would make from my sermon this past Sunday. I was preaching on Ecclesiastes chapter 2 about Solomon and all of his struggles that he went through in his life because he couldn't find any happiness with his work or his wealth. Um, and so the title of my sermon was Worship While You Work. Solomon, um, basically, as long as he was searching for happiness under the sun, it's a phrase he uses a lot, he couldn't find it. But when he began to look above the sun to God, the Creator, that's when he began to find uh, the goodness that you can find in this world. So uh, in that sermon, I uh, talked a little bit about stewardship, and I promised to uh, expand on that a little bit. So, you know, how do you worship while you work? Well, I had four parts. One was dedicate your work to the Lord. Paul says in Colossians 3 that we should work unto the Lord and not unto man. Whatever job we do, we're doing it really for the Lord. And, um, and, and through that uh, motivation, it then goes out to help other people as well. Um, another way of worshiping while you work is to live a thankful life. Psalm 115, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto you be glory according to your mercy and truth. It's because of God we have our creation, we have our life, we have everything that's truthful and loving and good ultimately. And that's where uh, we, we worship while we work, giving thanks. Then I talked about uh, stewardship, and I'm going to come back to that. That part in just a moment. And then finally, uh, spiritual rest. Uh, you know, if you do ask yourself, where in the Bible do we find one of the most significant passages about work? It's right there in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. So to worship while you work uh, really means to work and yet make sure that you are setting aside time to be connected, reconnected to the Lord in worship. Well, let me come back to that uh, part about stewardship, though. In that part of the sermon, I mentioned a, a sermon by John Wesley, the leader of the whole Methodist movement. Uh, if you remember a few Bible studies back, I kind of was a little hard on John Wesley because of his doctrine of perfectionism. I still think it's wrong, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're all a mixed bag. Um, none of us are perfect in our all of our thoughts and ideas. And uh, so while he might have been wrong in that area, he, he, he I think it was right in a lot of other areas in the Christian life. And he preached a sermon on Luke 16, the parable of the unjust servant, which really is a hard parable to preach on. And it was titled, The Use of Money. And he said three very famous things about the use of money. Uh, and, and this is what I wanted to explore a little bit more in this Bible study, because when I talked about Christian stewardship, uh, uh, I, I, I said that basically we want to um, do our work and, and, and acquire our wealth, um, not just to enjoy ourselves, but to use as good stewards for the sake of others. And so in this sermon, uh, he said three things, John Wesley, gain all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And uh, under the saving part, uh, he stressed the importance of doing it in a healthy and uh, biblical way. Uh, here's a quote from the sermon. It nearly concerns all those to consider this who have anything to do with taverns, victualing, victualing houses, opera houses, playhouses, and, uh, and other places of public fashionable diversion. If these profit the souls of men, you are clear, for your employment is good and your gain is innocent. But if they are either sinful in themselves or natural inlets to sin of various kinds, then it is to be feared you have a sad account to make. Oh, beware, lest God say in that day, These have perished in their iniquity, but their blood do I require at their hands. So earn or uh, make as much as you can, 
and then uh, save as much as you can. Again, quoting from his sermon, do not waste any part of so precious a talent merely by in gratifying the desire of the eye by superfluous or expensive apparel or by needless ornaments. Uh, waste no part of it in curiously adorning your houses in superfluous or expensive furniture, in costly pictures, painting, gilding, books, in elegant rather than useful gardens. Uh, Peter, you know, makes a similar comment in his first letter about uh, women. He's speaking about women in particular, but it would apply to everyone, you know, about, you know, decorating ourselves, costly pearls and things like that. Um, I'm going to come back to this in just a minute because yeah, this is a tough one. Um, how do you, you know, how, how austere a life should we live as Christians? And I think a lot of that it's best to be taken kind of on an individual basis, and, uh, and, and yet I think there's some guidelines, and Wesley gets to those, uh, that would help us uh, maybe understand how to approach that, um, saving all that you can, and, and living not, not living so extravagantly. Uh, then thirdly, so uh, gain all you can, uh, save all you can, and last of all, give all you can. And this is the stewardship part, uh, especially. Uh, but employ whatever God has entrusted you with in doing good, all possible good, in every possible kind and degree, to the household of faith, to all men. This is no small part of the wisdom of the just. Quote, Give all you have as well as all ye are, a spiritual sacrifice to him who withheld not from you his son, his only son. So, and here he quotes from uh, the parable of the rich fool, which was in our sermon this past Sunday from Luke 12, laying up in store for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come that ye may have, and ye may attain eternal life. All right, so how do we do all of this? You know, how uh, I guess uh, gaining as much as we can, that makes sense. You know, do the best you can with your life. Uh, I guess one of the worst forms of stewardship is simply being lazy and not working, uh, that means other. not only are you not helping others, but other people are forced now to help you. Uh, Paul uh, actually addresses that as well, that we should at least be able to, you know, we should work to take care of ourselves, but the, really the goal of work is and wealth is to take care of yourself first and then um, with the abundance that goes beyond that to help others. But how much? You know, how much, how austere do we have to be? Um, and uh, that reminds me of some things when I was a kid. I uh, grew up part, uh, part of my life, in my junior high years, especially in Charleston, Illinois, and there were Amish people around there, and I didn't get to know them very well. Of course, Amish kids don't come to uh, public schools where I, I was educated, um, but, you know, I saw them in their buggies and, um, and uh, things like that, and then when I went to uh, Greenville College in Greenville, Illinois, um, I, I encountered uh, a number of Christians who came from the Mennonite um, tradition. And Mennonites are kind of a, well, you got the Amish are really austere, and then, then the Mennonites are a little more relaxed. And I also had a, a Mennonite friends in my first church in Nebraska, Beamer, Nebraska, and, and I saw this kind of spectrum, and they all kind of had their own, I remember, a famous uh, thing they told me in Nebraska, their, one of their pa Mennonite pastors preached a sermon railing against speedboats. And uh, that left a long memory on the, on the minds of many people. So how, how do you know when you are being too extravagant and when you are, um, you know, spending too much on yourself? You know, the Bible is kind of careful not to get into too many specifics here. And I think that's typical of the Bible. It's the Bible's very wise, um, and I think it, it does a good job of of telling us, "Hey, this is something you need to think about." Uh, and there are other principles that can help guide us and help us in understanding uh, how to how to do that in our lives. And really, the the most foundational principle for all stewardship is tithing. Tithing. Tithe means tenth. goes back to Abraham. When Abraham gave a tenth uh, of the blessings, the things that he had gained 
um, uh, to Melchizedek, this mysterious high priest that we think is really kind of a precursor to the Messiah, to Jesus. And he gives a tenth. And then ever since then, there's, this is always commended in the Bible, this giving of a tenth. Um, Moses carries it forward in the uh, law of Moses as well. Sometimes Christians come along and say, well, you know, I la my last Bible study, I talked about weird commandments in the Bible. There are certain commandments that you might call identity commandments uh, that were apl that applied only to the Jewish people. And some say this is one of those two, but it is one of those that is carried over into the New Testament as well. Matthew 23, 23. Uh, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. So these are um, uh, spices. And uh, the Pharisees were so careful in their tithing that they tithed every little thing, you know, every little spice thing that they had. But Jesus goes on, And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. And as I said in last week's Bible study, this was their great problem. They loved those identity laws because those are measurable. You know, I gave a tenth of this and a tenth of that and a tenth of that and so on. And that was uh, something that fed human pride and, you know, I can show that off. Justice, mercy, and faith, eh, people don't always like to talk about those because those are the matters of the heart. And we all know deep down that we struggle and we have uh, problems when it comes to that. So Jesus says, these you ought to have done. Um, now, that would be, of course, the justice, mercy, and faith. But now, Jesus also says, without leaving the others undone. So the tithing on all the different things in our life is a principle that Jesus is, says, says, I'm not overturning that one. That's not, I'm not fulfilling that one for you. That one is, is one that will carry forward into the new covenant as well. And so this, that's where we get the principle of tithing and and uh, just, you know, we te I teach it this way in my, in my basic Christian theology class. Uh, I call it, we call it, the, many others have said it too, the 80-20 rule. Um, just, just learn to live on less. Live on 80%, save 10%, and give 10%. Uh, that's a real basic, uh, I think, a good principle. Um, if you think about it, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they look at a tithe of their salary, that I mean, that looks huge, and they can't imagine uh, giving that much to the work of God's kingdom and to their neighbor and other family uh, members who have need and things like that. Uh, it seems, uh, it seems uh, crazy for them. Uh, but if you turn, the, turn it around and said and ask them, if you had to, could you live on 90% of what you have? And I think most people realize they have to answer yes, because, you know, I might have to sometime. And so surely I, I could do that if I had to. So that really, I think, is the best way to look at tithing. You, you can do this. Um, this is not a this is not a impossible command that the Lord gives us. But what about this austerity thing? And um, and this is where I, I think it's important to note that while the New Testament commends tithing, um, it never says that you should stop there. And in other places, uh, people gave even more than that. Um, and sometimes Jesus told people to give everything they had. Uh, that was always specific. It, it was never a general commandment that God gave, Jesus gave to everybody. But uh, he did sometimes tell people to do that. Um, and that was probably because they themselves had some particular issue. They just, they were too locked into their money that, you know, it's like if you struggle with uh, alcohol addiction or something like that, you just got to go cold turkey. And, and I think there might be some cases where that kind of, of sacrifice might be uh, wise and, and required. But I, I think the best thing for us to think about when it comes to austerity is to, to work it backwards from the point of view of tithing. Yeah, I can live on 90%, but let's not just stop there. Um, when I was in college, I read the book Rich Christians in the Age of Hunger by Ron Sider. Um, he died just last week. Uh, this is a tremendous book. It had a great impact. Uh, a lot of the book has to do with statistics about, you know, just the comparison of wealth 
you know, for example, in Western countries versus the poverty in other countries. And um, one, I think Ron Sider, you know, offers some good and practical advice. He's not crazy, like, you know, I, I've, I don't believe in, you know, communism and things like that. All, all that is going to do is, is, is make everybody poor because it destroys the incentive for work. And it goes against, it goes against the seventh commandment. You know, if God says you shall not steal, then that means God says we should be able to be stewards of the things that we work for. Um, I know there's a, there's a biblical economic natural law principle there that will only create great incentives for people to be more productive and then everybody will be better off. But while we oppose communism because of its destructive nature, we cannot oppose generosity and we just have to say that while communism will fail, generosity will succeed. But we have to preach it and we have to teach it and we have to do it in our lives as well. Ron Sider suggested the graduated tithe. That is to say, as you go up in your income and wealth, not to just stop always at the tithe, but consider moving beyond that to 12%, 15%, 20%, uh, and then ask yourself, can I do that? You see, there's the question. How austere should I live my life? Well, just ask yourself if I, if I hacked it off at at uh, you know living now only on on 80 percent or 70 percent uh what would my life look like can i do that and i think that's a beautiful way to approach this question and i think uh it's a good way for us to all think about our stewardship take stock of what god has given to us as uh, wesley said gain all you can save all you can don't waste it and uh, foolish and foolish things and then ask ask yourself okay um how can I live um, in a good way, and how can I also give then as much as I can uh, for others and for the gospel and for God's kingdom? So that's my Bible study for this week. God's blessings to everyone, and uh, we encourage everyone to um, worship while you work. Uh, live with the, the grace of God in your hearts um, at all times, and, and dedicate your work and your wealth to the Lord.